Hello, and welcome to Sense of Responsibility. I'm Alec Lindenauer, a certified financial planning professional, husband, and chief allowance officer to two daughters. I'm also the creator of the Sense of Responsibility tools and how-to instruction parents need to raise their children into financially literate, money-savvy adults, even if they don't know much about finance themselves. I'm Julie Franz, a chef entrepreneur at heart, wife and mother of two middle school children. I also curate the Sense of Responsibility community so parents have a forum to ask questions, share success stories, and discuss their journeys. As a financial newbie myself, I'm also cultivating our group support system to help carve out my own family's path toward financial literacy. Welcome everyone to today's chat with Alec. I am so excited to talk to you about you this time, Alec. Um, and I have some fun questions, so let's dig in. Right. You know, we come from very different backgrounds um, of money. And um, we've talked about this before, uh, how, you know, in my family, we sat around the table, I had to eat my salad before I was able to get up from the dinner table. And, um, you know, there were specific rules about just kind of like our, you know, the way our family functioned in the evenings and, and then what we talked about. And it definitely was not about um, money. We talked about food. We talked about a lot of things, but I, you know, we didn't have conversations about money. And, and I know that you did, and we have gone in very different paths because of that. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your family and your upbringing and what that looked like? Sure. So my earliest, actually, memories of money really are around uh, conversations with my father. He uh, retired not too long ago from a longtime career on Wall Street. And my really my first memories were when he would teach me about stocks from the stock table. So I was I couldn't have been more than five or six years old, and um, stock prices were actually reported not even in pennies at the time. It was in fractions. It was you know five and an eighth or whatever. And we would talk about that. And I remember him explaining to me at a very young age, trying to explain currencies and how you know if you were sitting in a raft in the middle of the ocean and you like just these convoluted things. But, but it was the point being that money was a topic of conversation from a very, very young age. Um, my parents were divorced. We uh, lived in New York. And then I moved down here to Florida with, um, with my mother and my sister when I was probably about seven. Not too long after that, a couple of years later, my mother um, actually got into finance also. And she's been a financial advisor since 1986, 1986, 1980, 87. Um, so yet again, now at home, Again, we would talk about money on a, on a frequent basis. I remember, um, you know, in a lot of homes, it was like, you know, Jeopardy was on, you know, if I went to a friend's house at, you know, seven o'clock or something like that, not in my house. In my house, it was Lou Dobbs money line, seven o'clock, eight o'clock. That was, there was no CNBC at the time. There was Lou Dobbs money line. That was the show. I know that my mother would go and vanish. If I wanted to hang out with her, I could hang out in a room or whatever, but it was, it was, shh, that, that was the rule um, as she watched that. So money was something that was talked about with us. It was always, I'm not going to say it was a source of comfort or anything like that, but it was as common talking about money as it was talking about the dolphins or sports or, you know, whatever the case may be. When did you really decide, you know, that this would be something that you would then teach your kids in this way? Like you obviously, you know, yeah. don't watch Lou Dobbs at seven o'clock with your kids. You have your not. own. Is that what his name was? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, you and you're probably not studying Wall Street and um, and all of that the way your dad did with you. So so what got you into this program with your kids? What kicked that off? So um, so do you have a minute? Because it, it's a bit of a story, but I think it's a good one. <laughs> um, so when I graduated college, the first thing that I did was I helped start a company called Active.com, which is kind of like what uh, Ticketmaster is to spectator sports. Active.com is to participatory sports. Um, you go online, you can buy your your participate participatory ticket or you know whatever the case is, and it helps event organizers run that event. So started that um, um, with some other folks, ran that. Um, ultimately, I moved back from California where we moved it, started another company, sold that. And then one day in uh, 2005, I went to lunch with my mother and we were talking about, okay, what should I do next? I just sold my company. And she was talking about this transition that her industry was going through where people were investment managers as opposed to more of financial planners, financial advisors, and there was going to be this transition. And so we started talking about the things that she would need to do. And 
we both kind of looked at each other and we're like, we should work together. And so we did right after that lunch, we just decided, you know what, let's, let's work together. So we've been partners as financial advisors since 2005. So that's my day job. And um, along the journey that I've had as a certified financial planner practitioner is that it's staggering, it's absolutely staggering how many people I meet in a given week or in a given month who really, um, two things, one, don't really understand much about finance. And then second to that is practice what I would call good financial hygiene, right? They just, you know... A, so analogous to brushing your teeth, right? So balancing your your investments, or I would say balancing your checkbook, but who really does that anymore? But responsible spending, responsible debt, things like that, like that's good financial hygiene. So the amount of people that that do that, I was just struck at, at how few actually do. And um, so in one day I was reading an article actually about, I don't know, seven, eight years ago, and it was um, Sports Illustrated, and it was all about how uh, professional athletes, the the amount, the the high percentage of bankruptcy amongst athletes, and I was like, okay, well, this is something I could do. I love sports; I can help with that. And so I actually tried to create a foundation and try and make a difference there. And really, you know, how do you, what the nuts and bolts? How do you teach people so that they will be financially literate and and avoid that? Long story was that I, it just it was a lot of heavy lifting, and I I needed a partner to do that. I couldn't find a partner, but this bug had been planted, the seed had been been planted, which was how do you help people become financially literate? So along the same time there, I had my kids and and when we would go through, um, we were one of the, the last schools in our county, as you know, our, our kids' school, um, or, or their elementary school, we would walk them into their classroom as opposed to just drop them off. And we were still allowed to do that at that time. So almost every day when I would take my kids, they were in kindergarten and, and third grade at the time, they would ask me to buy trinkets at the, at the store. You know, they wanted to buy these erasers and like this stuff that I felt like I was wasting my money. It was like, this is ridiculous. I, I don't, don't want to spend my money on this stuff. And I, at the, you know, as a financial advisor, financial planner, I'm reading all this research about when their money habits are formed at, at seven years old. And I was like, okay, I need to start. I, I, I need to do something. And somebody gave me this, I call it a magical piggy bank because it was a piggy bank with four slots, spend, save, invest, and donate. And I read the manual and I was like, this is great. I mean, it needed some tweaking, don't get me wrong, but the idea behind it was fantastic. And so I just really sat there and kind of put pen to paper and said, okay, well, how should I do this for my kids if that's my goal? So I started doing it with them and I was amazed at how well it was working. And then I said, you know what? I need to bring this out in, into the community. So that's kind of the, the, the long form version of how it began. So, you know, there's obviously a problem um, in our society that I just don't know that a lot of parents are aware of, right? I mean, we know we need to teach our kids how to be move, you know, move to be healthy, to um, get involved in things in school, to have a you know variety of activities and how to eat so that they can have a lifelong you know, healthfulness and, but we, we're not, we're not really teaching our kids about money in the house, right? We expect that it's going to get done in the schools. And so, so what's the problem? What's, what's really happening that we really should um, talk about and, and make parents aware of? Wow. The problems are many. So there's so many problems. Um, I think that one of the biggest problems really is the disconnect in school, right? So lately there's a lot of noise that's been made about Hey, great. You need now in the state of Florida, as an example, you, you must have a financial literacy course or a personal finance course um, as mandatory for, for graduation. Great. That's in high school. Their money attitudes are already forming to a healthy degree. I mean, a meaningful degree when they're seven. So one class in high school is not going to cut it, right? You're giving me all of these years of history class, all of these years of math class and English class, but you're only giving me a semester or a year on personal finance. So what is the, per I'll ask you, I mean, what is the percentage of people in our country, Julie, who need to know the, the details around Columbus sailing across the ocean versus 
the percentage of people who will have a mortgage or who will have a credit card or who will have the need for financial literacy as a meaningful part of their every day. Right? Like, right. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it is crazy when you put it that way. So the reality of what should happen, if you really wanted to solve it in the schools, right, what you would do is you would interweave personal finance into the curriculum along the way. So in math class, as an example, instead of, I mean, I'm trying to help my kids with their math homework and they're trying to calculate, well, if a flight leaves LA and a flight leaves in New York, you know, do they cross in Denver or, you know, how many miles from New York will they be when they, when they cross versus, oh, you know what, maybe it should be mortgage calculations or, you know, how to, what is the price to earnings ratio for a stock or how does bond interest work and amortization? You know, all of these things are really should be in the math curriculum or in the history curriculum should mm -hmm. be, okay, what about some of the history of finance? So, so it should be along the way. And that's, that's just not going to happen. Right. There's just no way. Well, I do have to tell you, though, um, to interject, John just told me about a project they're working on in his math class right now. And I was shocked because it is so um, it is so along these lines of what we're talking about should be taught in schools. So, you know, it's towards the end of the year. They're not really getting into like new chapters and tests and stuff. So uh, what they're working on is that the kids took a test um, to see kind of like what their natural um, innate abilities would lead to in terms of a career path. So John's was like lawyer, firefighter, and some kind of public service servant or something. So he chose firefighter. So then you look at what is the mean um, salary of an entry level firefighter. No, I think the average salary of a firefighter in this area, in the city where we live. Um, and then they taught them like, you know, if you're going to look for a place to live, it should really only be 30% of your salary. And then we're going to look at utility bills. We're going to look at what things cost here. And so their current project is doing all of that math around, you know, what, what you make and how to spend it. And I was, I was blown away that this school is doing this, you know, end of year project. Uh, but that's like you said, it should be every year that they're, exactly. you know, that they're weaving these kinds of projects in exactly. with this learning. That is amazing. So, so amazing that it shouldn't yeah. be the end of year seventh grade throwaway project. No, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Exactly. <laughs> like we have nothing right. else to do. Right. So let's do this thing. Right. Yeah. How much time did he spend uh, on he surface He also cannot area? believe... <laughs> Right. He also cannot believe that a fireman does not make more money because his job is very, very important. And why, you know, do certain people make way more money doing less important work right. for the community? So right. that's also been a little bit of an eye-opening right. experience for him too. So, so going um, back, so but yeah, so I mean, schools, I agree. It's a big problem. Right. So, so that's one side of like, where should they get it from? Right. So if they're not getting it there, so where can they get it from? So I believe wholeheartedly that the best person to teach their, a child about finance is a parent or a caregiver. And the reason really is, the reasons are very simple. One is because the keys are practice and consistency strategy. Those are the keys. It is not, the key is not how knowledgeable is that person because you don't need them to be a money genius by any stretch. When I taught my kids how to ride a bike, I mean, I'm no Lance Armstrong. I just, I know how to ride a bike, you know, just like most parents, they know how to, they, they know, like use a credit card, pay it off, right? They know the basics of what a stock does. I mean, they know how to use their checking account. Maybe there's a learning curve. That's fine. But the elemental basics are very, very basic to learn. You just need to know where to get that. So that's what I try to do. I try to get parents to understand the basics at a very elementary level so that they can relate their adult world experience to their child's childlike experience so that they can share and practice and have that good financial hygiene. That's all you really need to get them there. It's not that complicated. Right. And we've, um, you know, we've talked a lot about the practice element and how important it is, you know, to start your kids early with a small amount of money so that they can practice. They might make a few mistakes. They might, um, you know, learn along the way of what was worth it or not worth it. But 
Um, but really by like that consistent handling of money, they're going to learn how to spend their money in their own way. Like you don't have to tell them, you know, don't waste your money on this and that they'll come to that conclusion when at the end of the week or the end of the month, they don't have any money left and what they purchased is stupid and it's broken and it's trash. And, you know, they're going to realize like, oh, I only have this amount of money. I don't want to use it on that. And I think you experienced that with the with the student store tchotchkes and the Starbucks. And I've experienced that with my kids too, of like they they just make better decisions, not because I told them exactly. to, but they had money to spend. And they saw, you know, Cassidy's like, I would rather spend $50 on a skirt I love than like $50 on five Starbucks trips that, whatever you know yeah. and look as humans the, we learn the best way we learn is by experience i mean you learn the stove is hot because you touch it and you burn yourself and you never do it again so it's like the same right. thing you're not going to use the money buy something that that is you know junk have a break and then be like oh let me do that again as opposed to if it's my money and my kid buys a little tchotchke and it breaks they're like daddy i want another <laughs> no, yeah that's my experience right? exactly. when they have the experience it's totally different Exactly. So, I mean, there was a point that you reached with your kids after this consistency and this practice um, where you realize this is working. Yeah. This methodology is actually something worthwhile and worth sharing. What was that point that you that you recognized? I've got something here. So I tell this story in, in the, the first course, in the, the allowance course, um, but it's great. I mean, it, it, it was it was life changing for all of us, for our, our whole household. So um, my oldest grace was, uh, she was either nine or 10 at the time and she had money to burn. It was just after her birthday. Um, I think she had like $20 or so in, in her pocket that she was like, okay, you know, I'd like to go to the toy store and buy a toy. That's what I want to do with my birthday money. And I, and I have this $20 set to spend. So great. So we go to the, the toy store and actually it was the four of us. It was, it was uh, my wife and also my, my little one was with us. And so the four of us go into the toy store and Grace walks up to this uh, board game. It was called Googly Eyes. I'll never forget it. And she pulls it off the shelf and she's like, okay, I, I, th I think this is the one. And now I'm going to get the numbers a little wrong, but, but the point is the same. So my wife, she scans it with her, with her phone. And she says to my daughter, she says to Grace, she's like, look now, on Amazon, and we we pay for Prime, so it's like in two days you could get this for for ten dollars, um, and here in the store it's like sixteen dollars. You know, something that was like a six or four dollar difference or whatever it was. And so keep in mind, she's nine years old, right, or ten years old, and she's like, she's staring at that box. She's she's practically drooling. I'm practically like wiping the drool off her face because she's envisioning taking it home, you know, right then and playing it. And she's, it's her birthday. She's super excited, and so after like 10 minutes, I go back. I'm like, okay, Grace, it's like, it's decision time. You know, what do you want to do? And she put it back on the shelf and she said, I think I'm going to wait because it's not worth the extra, you know, four or $6, whatever it was for, for the two days. It's more important that I save that money. So what are we trying to teach our kids, right? The need versus want, but, you know, delayed gratification for a nine-year-old or for a 10-year-old that has, you know, in her eyes, a wad of cash in a toy store. Like, to me, I was like, I was blown away that, that it worked. Winning. As, right? <laughs> Hashtag winning. So I was completely <laughs> blown away. I was like, this is, this is gold. And so that's when I started, that's really when the wheel started turning one that I knew that it was working for them, but two that, okay, maybe that whole athlete concept, maybe that doesn't make sense. Maybe this is, since I'm living, eating and breathing this, and I can do this myself, maybe this is what really needs to, to go out into the community. And so that was the kind of the moment that yeah. sense of responsibility was born without a, a name. And also that it was like, yeah, I'm on the right path. And so what was that first time that you actually delivered that message to an audience? Like, you, you know, you were doing this in your own home and then there was a, a turning point where you, you realized you needed to share this. This was awesome. How did that transformation happen? Well, Julie, that's a completely loaded question <laughs> and you know it. <laughs> it's a loaded question uh, because I told you um, that this was something that I was going to do and I was going to bring it out to the community. And you said to me, well, I have the perfect venue where you were at uh, this amazing venue that uh, I'm here in Miami, that Miamians will know it as the Wynwood Yard. 
um, and you were managing the community events there amongst many other roles that you were you were managing there. And there was that kid entrepreneurship day and you said, you know what, parents would really like to hear this. And despite the fact that your kids weren't doing it yet, you saw the value in it, you knew it, you know, you knew it was helpful and, and working in my house. So that was the impetus. And that was in 2018, I believe it was. Um, that was mm-hmm. the very first time. And then uh, there were a couple of workshops after that. And and that really forced you to put it into decks and put it into a presentation and hundred um, percent and get that that momentum going yep putting it out on paper yep. what's next what uh, this is my last question for the day like what you know now you you did it this whole project with your family you continue to do so you're now encouraging other families um, you know through your different teaching opportunities um, you know what what do we have going on now and what do you see you know from here on out of, of What's possible so, with this program? I mean, for now, super excited about the course that's out there, which is you know the two chapters. The first is allowance and introducing that for elementary age kids. The second is for um, how do you then use that conversation for the rest of the month? Because as you know, uh, we focus on core money Sunday, that first Sunday of every month being that core allowance day. So spending income and credit is really what you want to teach the rest of the month. So the next course after that is going to be using the lemonade stand or another mini business as an opportunity with your child to teach them how does business work to translate that into the second part of the course, which is um, helping them understand the basics of investing, which I know is scary for a lot of parents, but it's just, it's so critically important. And the mini business is that foundation that they need to do that. And the challenge that I put out there to parents along the way in the course is that by the time they graduate elementary school, that they have an account, that they have some investment that they own. And that becomes part of the that core money Sunday is not just giving allowance and talking through the spend and the save and the invest and the donate, but also, okay, let's look at your investments. So that's the challenge. And then now, as uh, my oldest just graduated uh, from middle school, and my little one is still firmly in middle school, is then the future class for next year or future course, I should say, is really all about middle school and and then we'll go into into high school from there. But I think a, a really important part of this for me is that I don't want to talk about anything that's theoretical. If I don't do it and I haven't seen it work, I don't really want to talk about it with people. The only exception would be if I knew somebody and I could see it firsthand and I know what they're doing is working, you know, then I would. But um, but I have to really see it firsthand to know it's working. And, and uh, so that's the plan. Awesome. Um, Yep. Well, I am super excited to be on this path with you and learning from you along the way and um, and being able to share this journey with the community and get more and more parents and kids on this financial literacy path. Um, It's been really transformative for my family. I'm super grateful that um, you shared it with me when you did. And um, I just I'm really excited for more and more people to watch the course online and like really follow the steps. It's not rocket science. Like you make it really easy to understand if I could learn it and do it. (laughs) Anybody can because I did not know what I was doing. Um, But, you know, I mean, it's really shifted the way our whole family thinks about money and handles money. And I want to share it with the world with you. I'm I'm very excited about what we're offering to to families everywhere I'm, now. I'm with you. The uh, one of the statistics that always stays with me is that um, T. Rowe Price, this financial conglomerate, they do a survey every year, and it's always this number is always about the same, which is that ninety um, percent of financial conversations in a home with children are reactive. So, what do I really want to do? I mean. It would be amazing if that were flipped on its head. If 90% of those conversations were proactive or even 50% were proactive and now it's a give and take, I mean, that's really the, the idea is to move that needle so people feel like they, they can be proactive. That, that's, that's what it's all about, consistency and strategy. Consistency and strategy. (laughs) Well, I mean, people can get the course online. It's live. It's ready. That first course teaching your elementary age child how to be money savvy. It is live and we can, you know, we can help more and more families through that course. So thank you so, so much for everything, Alex. All right, Julie, this was fun. Let's do it again. Yep. See you next time.